Hello to all you in YouTube world. My name is Scarlett, and I am an atheist and skeptic in progress. I like to contemplate matters of life and philosophy, especially what gives us meaning and purpose. Today, the oddity in the Bible I want to contemplate is God's plan for women. Most people are probably familiar with the Bible teaching that women should be man's helpmeet, and in the New Testament that a woman should be silent and not teach. So I'd like to go to some other passages I find interesting and don't get discussed much. Of course, people are probably familiar with the conflicting Genesis accounts. Genesis 1, God created men and women together at the same time. And in Genesis 2, he creates Adam first and then Eve. And then, of course, we get the passage at the end of Genesis 2 that justifies Christian marriage, God's plan for Christian marriage. I don't want to get into the apologetics that try to harmonize these two accounts, but I do find it interesting that Genesis 1 is about reproduction and there is no mention of marriage, while Genesis 2 says that Adam and Eve are husband and wife. No ceremony or anything, they are just declared thus. But it doesn't mention reproduction here. In any case, I wonder what marriage could possibly mean when you are the only two of your species on earth. I mean, marriage is a social phenomenon that usually means you form a unit within a larger community. Here, there is no community. But anyway, of course, the important thing to establish is that Eve was created second and is lesser. Let's move on to Leviticus, a few books into the Bible. For those who might not recall, Leviticus is one of the law books. It provides instructions on different sacrifices and offerings that Yahweh requires and it goes over rules that the Israelites are supposed to follow. These laws show a certain, let's say, obsession with the unclean, which does not mean dirty or needing to be washed. It is a certain spiritual uncleanliness. Certain acts mean that you are ceremonially unclean. And there's also a certain obsession with blood and bodily fluids. First stop for us is Leviticus 12 in which we learn that women who give birth are unclean. We note especially that when giving birth to a boy, she is unclean for seven days, and then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified, whereas if she has a girl, it is double, 14 days and then 66 to purification. Then she must make a sin offering, which is also outlined here. Without going into all the differences between the offerings Yahweh requires, and oh, does he require lots of animals spilling their blood. I just want to point out the absurdity of a natural process requiring a sin offering. In Genesis 1, God told the humans to multiply and fill the earth. In Genesis 3, he tells Eve she will have painful childbirth, but none of that says that giving birth is a sin. Of course, childbirth requires a sin offering because of the bodily fluids that exit the body. And we see more of this with God's plan for her monthly period. All of this is outlined in Leviticus 15, which deals with discharges that cause uncleanliness. It starts with men's discharges, and as is always the case, the man is unclean and anything he touches is unclean as well. And in the same chapter, verse 18, we see that when there's a discharge of semen during sexual intercourse, both people are unclean. Then a woman on her regular period is considered unclean, and as usual, anything she touches or anyone who touches her will also be unclean. Sexual relations with her means that the man is unclean for seven days, and if she has a period-like discharge, she is also unclean, and as usual, everything she touches will also be considered unclean. And so at the end of all this, uh, she needs to wait a certain amount of time, seven days, and then she needs to take an offering to the priest. He'll make a sin offering and a burnt offering in atonement for having her monthly period or a discharge outside of her period. I have so many thoughts on this chapter of Leviticus. First, I find it incredible how much of their life women are considered unclean. Still today, I know Jewish men who will not shake women's hands because of this chapter of Leviticus. Because you can't know if a woman is having her period or even a bit of discharge outside of her monthly cycle. Men avoid touching her. 
What a message for young girls to think that a natural phenomenon outside your control means you are unclean. And again, this is not about cleanliness. We have all kinds of ways for women to stay clean during this time of the month. The cleanliness is spiritual. I can see why women would not want to emphasize this part of God's plan for them. Would any Christian woman want to be separate from family for five or more days a month? By the way, Leviticus 20 emphasizes that husbands are not to have relations with their wives during this time of the month. This is verse 18, and most of chapter 20 is actually about incest, so this is a very odd insertion. So what do these passages say about Yahweh? He created these beings, and then he punishes them for being human, for being how he created them. The same issue arises if the Israelites get sores that create discharge. Just having discharge is somehow icky to God. He just created people to be disgusting, and women particularly so. What I wonder is why an all-loving God would make you sacrifice animals to purify yourself for being the way he created you. And then why did he change his mind so that it isn't required today? Of course, today we abhor the notion of sacrifice, but you would think an unchanging God would not, well, change his mind. All right, enough pondering the oddities of uncleanliness in the Old Testament. Let's skip to the New Testament and see an interesting and little quoted part of 1 Corinthians. So in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, we see in verse 4 that every man who prays or prophecies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophecies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. Okay, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Continuing on in verse 7, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for that reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Okay, uh, verse 11, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Okay, so we basically we just see the hierarchy of man, God, then man, then woman, each the image of the other. Um, but anyway, once again, this is women covering their head, women not being as significant as men. And finishing up, starting in verse 13, Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. To be honest, I'm not sure why anyone would listen to Paul. He wasn't a disciple of Jesus, never even met the guy, and he didn't agree with the other disciples about what Christianity was. But this is something I don't see respected much at all. Women do not cover their heads to pray in most churches today. Most women don't think of their hair as a covering. But according to Paul, this is part of God's plan. I guess the main deal is women are still considered the reflection of men. Overall, though, what I find strange is all this weird superficiality. Like, what does it matter how you pray? Isn't it more important how you feel, how you express yourself, what you say? But really, I think these rules are ways of controlling people, making them feel insecure about themselves and their bodies, then offering rituals to make them feel they can do something about it. Of course, I don't believe in a God who ordained all this stuff. I think the writers of Leviticus and Paul in the New Testament wanted to create practices that bound people further to this religion. They were authoritarians who wanted control over people's lives in the name of their God, it's a kind of cultish behavior. And the thing is, it works, and it has worked. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about it here. We'll look at more of God's plan for women in a future oddities of the Bible. 
I've been Scarlet, giving my life meaning and purpose by making this video. If you liked it, you can, you know, YouTube like it and all that stuff. You know, you're on YouTube. You know the drill. See you in the next one. Bye for now.